Hey, I'm Jason, and welcome to Season 3 of the Tales from the Pit Podcast. Welcome to Tales from the Pit, the behind the lens access to the entertainment world and the creative people involved. Today, we have musician, everything. He's worked with so many bands. I'm super excited to talk with him. His name is Sahaj Tikkadin from the band Ra and many other projects. Sahaj, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Hopefully, I said your name correctly. Ah, it's <laughs> close, fine. En- close enough. All right. Sorry. Close enough. Uh, <laughs> so let's let's get started with a little background. How did you get involved with music? Maybe in your childhood, did you you know what was your influences? How did you get started? All that sort of stuff. I mean, my uh, my family's in the entertainment business. Uh, my sisters and brothers all danced and sang. Um, by the time I was five years old, I was already singing um, in the, you know around the family and my brothers who were. My brothers and sisters, who are all older, a lot older than me, uh, they were bringing home a lot of interesting music. My sisters were bringing home Carly Simon and James Taylor, and um, my brother was bringing home Stanley Clark and and uh, Return to Forever and a bunch of fusion jazz things. And then eventually, he brought home The Police and Peter Gabriel, um, and my other sisters started bringing home like. Michael Jackson, Henny Loggins, things like that. So, I mean, it all, uh, Prince, another one, but really, um, it was all them bringing music into my house. Plus, my dad was a huge classical music guy. So, a lot of Tchaikovsky, a lot of Beethoven, a lot of uh, Prokofiev, a lot of all that heavy, the, the heavy, rich, dense, uh, late 1800s you know, uh, Gustav Holst, all that stuff. Uh, he liked, he liked things very dramatic, very, very Russian Jew. Cause he was Russian Jew. Sure. And, uh, all of that sort of dark heaviness, I think, uh, sort of stuck to me. Cause I got really attached to music that was dramatic. And then, uh, I think probably fifth or sixth grade, I met this one kid who had a patch on his denim jacket that we had several, but one that I stuck out to me was the Ozzy Osbourne one. Oh yeah. And Ozzy uh, paranoid was sort of my black Sabbath paranoid was sort of my foray into heavy music, which led me from that into, I want to say I actually got into guitar, like, like, like Steve Vai's flexible. Yep. And, um, a few guitar-y type things before I really dove heavy into Metallica. So okay. I was a very early adopter of Metallica. I was into Metallica on the Kill 'Em All album. So when nice. Kill 'Em All came out, I, I bought it on vinyl, had it the year it came out, and uh, was very into Metallica immediately. And that sort of launched me into a whole sphere of things it uh it brought me to queens reich eventually yep <clears throat> um i got really into joe satriani as soon as i decided i wanted to start playing guitar so joe satriani was a huge one is that you know, like surfing with the alien time uh, pr- before that that was oh, okay it, right yep. it was, uh, not of this earth which is his oh, first yeah. yep. so the um all of that was sort of an offshoot of my obsession with the police because the once i heard uh, Zenyatta Mandata in the early 80s, I, uh, that was my sound. That was the band that was going to sort of be the center of my universe. And then I would say a very close second was Prince, yep. uh, Purple Rain, and then um, the Raspberry Beret album, and then Under the Cherry Moon album. All that stuff is very, very influential to me. First concert I ever went to ever in my whole life was Prince. 
Oh, no way. Awesome. No. Yeah, it sort of ruined everything else. But yeah, I was going to say, so, you're peeking right off the, <laughs> the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And I saw him, you know, when he was young and on fire and Madison Square Garden, and it was just insanity. But yeah, um, but yeah so that started the whole sort of formulation of everything. It was pretty pretty eclectic, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I was obsessed with Paul McCartney shortly after... Um, once I sort of became a musician, I became obsessed with Paul McCartney. And I say Paul McCartney because actually I was into some of his weird, like he had an album called McCartney and then an album called McCartney too. And I was into those before I was actually into the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then a lot of that sort of really built the foundations of, of how I hear music. And then uh, the grunge thing happened and the band that I attached myself to in the grunge thing was uh, Soundgarden. Yep. Um, because Chris Cornell to me was the, the most sort of like, again, from the position of not only writing pat like Pearl Jam and, and bands, they wrote passionately about passionate things, but I didn't think the songwriting and the musicality was necessarily passion based, yeah. uh, but Soundgarden was to me. So like the yeah. songwriting in, in Soundgarden was very passion based and his singing style was something that I was very attracted to as a sort of counter to what I had attached myself to with Sting and Peter Gabriel. So I thought if you take, you know, Sting and Peter Gabriel and then throw in Soundgarden, you start getting something sort of interesting. And then the other oh, yeah. band that came along and sort of changed the way I perceived modern music was Korn. Yep. So ultimately by the late nineties, the, 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 the sound bite description of what I wanted to create was, um, you know, Peter Gabriel and Sting meets Corn and Metallica thrown into a, a bucket <laughs> yeah. with a little bit of with a little bit of Soundgarden and a little bit of Joe Satriani. You know, that's that's a crazy but awesome mix of stuff. That's for sure. When it, when it comes with going back to your your uh, your upbringing and stuff like that, what did you, what area did you grow up in? Were, were you in the East Coast or? Yes, yeah, so I was born in the Bronx. Okay. Uh, from the Bronx, we moved to Queens, uh, Jackson Heights, Queens in when I was three. So I don't really remember the Bronx that much. Um, and then I lived most of my youth up until 23, 24. Uh, I lived in Jackson Heights, Queens. And then my dad, who was in the a wholesale car business, was working in a place called Teterboro, New Jersey. And I, uh, uh, I started working for him when I was roughly 24, 25. So I moved to Inglewood, New Jersey, Fort Lee, New Jersey, yep. and lived there for a while. And then I lived in Connecticut for a little bit and then back to Jersey. And that was sort of the, during the time where I was, you know, what I would call uh, serious and professional about the music business. So I started yep. to really, you know, really attack it from a trying to get record deals and all that stuff perspective. When you were when you were younger, and I mean, you're surrounded by so much talent and a wide a wide variety of talent, as you just mentioned. I'm reading your bio about uh, pe your family members in film and stuff like that, and video games stuff like that. But when you were younger, were was was music sort of I don't want to say push, but was music in was you know was it was there a lot of push for you to be involved with music, or was it, it just naturally just was something you were into? No, it was sort of. Uh... Um, it was, I was the black sheep of the family. Everyone in my family ended up in film and television and acting and Broadway and stuff like that. And, um, I had a, I had a desire for it yep. and there was a period in time where I worked on a bunch of movies in a row and behind the scenes with my brother. Um, and there was an opportunity to sort of like, you know, that multiverse version of the universe where you can live that other life that you could have possibly lived. So it, at the age of 19, I worked on a movie called Lock Up, which is a Sylvester Stallone movie with my brother. <laughs> and in the middle of that movie, the uh, stunt coordinator, who's a famous guy, famous stunt guy, also a second, uh, uh, second unit director for the film, yeah. he, um, he asked me to be his assistant. Like He wanted me to leave Jersey and go to Arizona and work with him on his next film. And then he was going to train me as a stunt man. And no put me in movies, uh, put me in movies. Cause at 19, all I did was work out and do martial arts all the time and whatever. <laughs> yep. And so he uh, asked me if I wanted to, you know, basically move to California. And I had just met like my first serious girlfriend. So I was, 
more interested in that. Plus I had my band and I didn't want to change that. Yep. But there is that, you know, there is that multiverse thread where I decided to go to Hollywood and become a stuntman and probably would have been able, you know, part of me didn't believe that you could be uh, an actor and an artist, you know, an actor and a musician. Right. Um, you see, there, there have been a few exceptions to that. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't, I chose not to do that, but I stayed with music uh, pretty much the entire time. Yep. And, you know, it, it was an interesting way to live because there's always sort of a pot of gold out of arm's reach in the music business it's never quite it's never quite there you know yeah it's like carrot almost in front yeah, of, yeah. In front of you. <laughs> yeah the uh, uh as a child were you doing music in school were you involved with like you know band stuff like that yeah so in 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 uh junior high school sixth seventh eighth grade um they we had a glee club so in sixth grade, I was in the Glee Club, and I actually, by seventh grade, I was in the Glee Club, but I was, so what happened was, is I started getting all these solos, like the teacher would give me features, and I started to think, and I wasn't wrong, I think the other kids were mad that I kept on getting all the solos, and I didn't like that attention, I didn't like having to feel like, you know, I'm getting all the solos and people don't like me because of that. Right. <laughs> so I stopped and eventually I actually left the geek. I like got out of it. I didn't stop singing, but I got out of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't want to sing in front of a lot of people because I didn't like being singled out for being better. Sure. And then the other part of it was, um, which is, well, it carried on into high school. So when I went to high school, I went to LaGuardia high school, which is like the fame school. Yep. And, um, I got in for both painting and music oh, wow. and I chose to go for painting because I didn't want to be taught how to do music. Really? I felt at, at that point I was already in my brain. I was like, I don't want to learn what everyone else does because I'll just do what everyone else does. Yep. I so it. I consciously went there and, and uh, studied, you know, drawing and painting and stuff like that, which I really enjoyed, but it was never really going to be my path. Yeah. Um, and by the time I was a senior, by the middle of the year, I had already transitioned back to doing pretty much music all the time and started my first band then. Are you still doing painting at all? Is that still something you do? Already? I do. I, yeah, I do. Art, I mean, like the raw logos and a lot of the artwork. Me too. And, okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I do a lot of it. Um, That's awesome. The, uh, I haven't pulled out, you know, a paintbrush and stuff like that, but I used to do a lot of graffiti and a lot of comic book art. So that stuff oh, nice. I still sort of pull out. Me and my son sometimes, you know, because he, he likes to draw. So we've been doing that together. Nice, nice. Yeah. So, so after high school, I mean, you and I are sort of in the same time period. Uh, after high school, I, I mean, are you playing out? Are you, are you putting a band together and playing out or are you just kind of doing your own thing or? No, I had a band that was, was this guy, Nandi Johannes, who was sort of my mentor on the guitar. He was like, we were the same age, but he had gone to LaGuardia. He played violin. He was a great guitar player, very unique, incredibly. One of those guys that if he had pursued guitar playing just as a guitar player, he would have been as famous as any of those dudes. And he, um, he you know, basically I learned how to play guitar through him vicariously. And I took a lot of the things that he did and I mixed them with the, the guys that I like, like Satriani and stuff like that. And I started coming up with my own thing. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, me and him had a band for almost 10 years. Okay. So from 18 to 20, you know, the mid 20s. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From like 18 years old, about six, seven years. Yeah, about 10 years we were together. Wow. And uh, by the by the time it was, you know, 26, 27, 28, that was when we were all sort of like in different uh, paths and it just didn't work out. There was just too many like personality things. But the um, but the music we made was was already something I thought was competitive. And yeah. he, um, you know, he, he actually wrote one of Ra's most uh, fan favorite song. This song called Sky is a, okay, is a yeah. song by Nandi. Yep. Uh, and I just sort of did my version of it, but it's really his song. Nice. <clears throat> and uh, the we started playing shows. I want to say by the time we were twenty, we were probably playing shows regularly. 
Um, we, we would play a show here or there, but then we started playing shows at like Continental and CBGBs, all the places in New York you played. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you never really got very far in New York with hard rock just because um, it wasn't a hard rock town at that time. But, you know, it set up a lot of the things that I ended up sort of being able to do later on. Uh, I was, just, you know, I've always been and sort of habitually am a late bloomer. So everything in my late 20s was all the stuff that most people get done in their early 20s. Right, but yeah. you know, I got signed Universal at 32, which is old. But um, the, you know, it was sort of a double-edged sword. Like I was mature enough to handle the situation, but I also had the unfortunate arrogance of being that age and thinking I knew what I was doing when I did. You know? right. <laughs> so pretty, uh, I would have rather have not known what I was doing at 22 than 32. Going back to your like first guitar and stuff like that, do you remember like your first songs or anything like that? Were you, were you doing? Yeah, covers? so I mean, I'm I'm so I have a I have like a weird musical memory. It's weird. I don't yeah. have uh, I don't have like a photographic memory with words or anything like that. But music, for some reason, I almost it's it's very close to that. Like I can remember guitar solos and songs, it's note for note that I listened really? to when I was 18 years old. I I mean. Nice. It, there's there are certain songs you know that that have just always stuck to me with guitar solos and I can sing them all. Ingve songs like I remember the solo in Black Star yep. like I can sing that along sing along with that note for note it's yep. easy for me nice. but um, the yeah so I guess you know the first song that I ever wrote was a song with that guy Nandi and it was about Hamlet because that's how we met we met in in English in high school English and we had to do a project and we were like, well, let's write a song. And so I had to write a song about Hamlet. I was, I was very into Shakespeare. Um, I worked oh, cool. at the Delacorte theater, uh, Shakespeare yep. in a park for six years, seven years of my life. Oh, no kidding. I loved, I loved, I was a huge Shakespeare fan. So when writing a song about Hamlet, <coughs> um, it was, uh, it was uh, pretty easy. And then I was like, Oh, I can do this. And then I started writing other songs. And the second song I ever wrote in my entire life was a song called please tell me, which I put on my, um, on my solo album, the solo album I did in 2012, um, has that song on it and it's essentially unchanged. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's nice. 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 Very cool. The, uh, uh, moving. Well, I, I, one, one more childhood question. Did your, everyone else was probably in films and stuff like that. As you as you mentioned, mm -hmm. was there, uh, for your family were, I mean, you were more musically focused. Were you the most musically focused of, of all your siblings? Well, my brother, Marcus, I have two brothers, David and Marcus. David, by the time 1977, 1978 rolled around, my brother, David, was working as a location manager for New York film and television projects that were going on. Yeah. So that was his, from 1977 to literally this day, that has been his... I'm not kidding. Okay, cool. He, he went from location manager to now he's like a producer and a unit production manager and all that stuff. Oh, kill and uh, my brother Marcus actually started um, his universe as an opera singer. So oh, he, okay, uh, okay. he was focused, he went to the Manus Conservatory of Music in New York and he was focused on opera for several years, I don't say four or five years. Um, and then ultimately went into corporate America doing different things. Um, he was the one who got involved with entertainment companies and ultimately Dark Age Camelot, which is a big video game back in the day. Yep. And uh, now he's doing uh, all these really cool sort of corporate consulting jobs for these uh, creative uh, endeavors with the virtual reality and all this other stuff. Oh, killer, killer. Okay, yep. cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so uh, moving forward anyways, uh, at what point, because you've, Ross started in 2002, so there's a big chunk of time so there technically, between. Technically, Ross started in 1998. So oh, okay, okay. In 1998, I start recording all of these songs. And uh, I'm, these are the songs that I'm basically writing after I stopped working with Nandi. And within those songs, uh, there's several that people know, like Rectifier and Do You Call My Name and all that stuff. Yep. Those are all from 1998. 1999 rolls around. And there was a movie called The Rage, Carrie 2. It was a failed ca uh, Carrie sequel. Yeah. And uh, the end title song was a song that I'd written with Nandi back in the day. The guy who was the music supervisor knew us. 
Okay. And like the song and said, Hey, would you put this together? And, but he want, you know, he needed it to be put out as a band and I recorded it my own way. And then the guy was like, <coughs> um, well, I need a name. What are you going to call it? And I had had dinner with a friend and I was going through these names and I had a whole bunch of weird names. Um, and then I had thought about Ra mostly because at the time I was still obsessed with Sting and, and every song that, you know, so Sting used to write a lot of songs about the moon. So he had yep. like walking on the moon. It's just, he has an album called nothing like the sun, which is a very Shakespearean reference to the moon. Sure. There's all kinds of stuff, moon over bourbon street. So I wanted to be like Sting. So I started writing all these songs about the sun. So I had the sun in almost all my songs without me, you know, I was sort of doing it on purpose, but I really wasn't. And I just realized, Oh, it's, that's sort of cool. <clears throat> and then I named the band Ra. And when I named the band Ra, that was the point at which I, well, when anyway, I named the band Ra and I told the guy, literally as I was getting on a plane, he was like, what's the name of the band? I was like, ah, uh, Ra. So he just, that was it. There's no logo. There was no nothing. In fact, the, the, the font that they used for the actual CD of that is just a random, terrible font for Ra. <laughs> um, but what that did was it sort of created in me the, oh, well, if I'm going to call it Ra and I'm going to use these references to the sun, then I'm going to lean a little bit more on the Arabic aspect yep. and start writing songs that have a little bit of that flavor. Yep. Um, and what I quickly discovered because as a singer, singer, right? When I say singer, singer, meaning I'm not a guy that screams. I don't really have this, like I can do it now a little bit more than I used to, but back in those days, I literally, you know, singing like sting and being clean was really all I could do. Yep. <clears throat> and the, um, I guess the, the thing that was great about writing songs in harmonic minor Arabic scales was uh, that it added heaviness to the track without necessarily having to scream. So there was this mystery and this darkness that came out of these songs without me having to necessarily have a scratchy vocal over yep. it. And yep. so I sort of leaned on that a little bit in the beginning, especially to make things uh, heavier and more you know, competitive in the new metal universe. Although I didn't, we didn't call it new metal at the time because we didn't know what it was. Right. Right. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's how it all got started. The, yeah. And how does, how does, how do you get the band members? Cause you have got PJ who's basically was trickster prior. You've got Ben who's actually, I'm in Portland, Maine. Ben is from Maine, but I think MIT is probably uh, not MIT. Uh, uh, well, you, you tell me, how did you get the band together? So uh, the person that I was in the band with the most was Scooter. So in, in, in 1996, uh, my brother was working for an entertainment company that had a budget for music. And so I, I started working with my brother's company. Um, and in that process of putting that band together, uh, I auditioned every session drummer in New York. And that was a little bit, that music was a little bit more confused. It had a lot more rappy limp biscuity things going on and had a little bit less wasn't really you know it still had some of the, the songs that i had already been doing but it didn't have a clear vision yet you know sure. it's just typical sort of like <coughs> talent without a vision you know yeah. i yeah. think um but when we did the auditions i had this one weird song and all the people who played it were terrible and then scooter sat down and played it perfectly so in 1996 i started working with scooter and he was, you know, he was very much the backbone because his abilities and his style was so suited to the way that I heard. Yep. I wanted rock to have this, this urban sort of pocket to it. And he, uh, he came in with that and we got along, you know, really well, especially musically. And then that was, you know, pretty much four years like that. I mean, we had other bass players and guitar players, but by the time I didn't meet Ben until 2002. So in the be uh, beginning, the very, very beginning, like February-ish of 2002, I meet Ben and Ben convinces me that we should be playing in Boston and not be playing in, in New York, New Jersey. And that helps. And then we get a bass player in, New in Boston to join the band. Actually, the truth is I called <coughs> my friend uh, Seven who lived in New Jersey and I asked him if he knew a bass player and he says, you should use PJ. So I called PJ and I said, hey, what's up? Would you be interested? And he's like, oh, man, I'm really busy. Da, 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 da. I was like, okay, fine. So then I went up to Boston, started playing with this other guy, Sean. 
And we ended up getting a record deal. Like we do the whole thing. We sell a whole bunch of CDs. We get it on a radio. Do you call my name is doing well. So we get a record deal at Universal Republic. And then all of course, um, a year, basically a year goes by with Sean as the bass player. And then Sean does a few things that me and him butt heads. It doesn't go well. I end up firing Sean out of the band and we are on tour with Stone Sour at the time. And nice. I literally called PJ and said, Hey man, we need a replacement. Are you going to do this? And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, how long will it take you to get out here? And he's like, three days. And he learned the whole set in three days and came out and took over. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. And PJ was on, you know, was in the band since then. So technically 2003 to 2023. So 20 years with him, yep. 21 years with, uh, with uh, Ben, and yep. then 26 or seven years with Scooter. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I, as, as a teen, I was a huge trickster right from the beginning. I was a huge trickster guy from the I'm beginning. So. Sorry to hear <laughs> I, was, I was just, you know, both me and my wife were really like hardcore. We still listen to Trickster all the time. <laughs> the, uh, um, so yeah, so it was, yeah, um, you know, I've seen Ben. I mean, he's not up here anymore, but I've known Ben from the local scene and stuff like that as a musician mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So first tour, what your first tour was with Stone Sour, is that what you said? No, first tour ever, ever, like legit tour was with Seether. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Now yeah. you guys like in a van, what was that like? No, we were signed to a major label and there oh, was cool. money in the universe back in those days. So yeah. we went literally from playing four times a month to playing six times a week. And we were out in a full tour bus with a trailer and it was, you know, literally zero to a million miles an hour. I mean, we got yeah. a very big record deal. Like the amount of money that Universal dropped um, was, <clears throat> you know, because of the success we had had in Boston, they just thought we were just going to blow up everywhere. Right, and yeah. there were some timing issues, and there were some bad decisions, and a few other things, and this and that, and a little bit of this, and a lot of ignorance that ultimately sort of stymied our success at the very, very beginning. Okay. But you know, all ultimately, the lesson was, of course, that you know, great songs and talent only is only you know fifty percent of the equation. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. The the I mean back then record D, I mean today I mean you probably have a, a way great greater uh, knowledge of what's going on with all the bands you work on which we'll talk about in a minute but back then record labels were you signed to X amount of labels uh, X I'm sorry X amount of albums you tour for X amount of time period and stuff like that was that your sort of deal originally so you had a two album deal at University of Public. Yeah. Um, for a budget. It was a yeah. lot of money. Yeah. And, you know, without the, without sort of, there was no game plan, even from the label standpoint, there was no game plan for the death of CDs. They just didn't have oh, really? yeah, any yeah. idea of how to approach what was coming. And it was starting, you know, it didn't really hit until 2005. Yep. But it was starting in the it, right after 9-11. Yep. So the, you know, I like to blame myself. Uh, actually, the funny thing is, is that on the second album, I actually did the right thing. I, we had a $425,000 budget to make the second record. And my, and what I told our manager and what I told the labels, like, I want 40,000 bucks to go out and buy a bunch of gear and make this record and I don't want to spend any more than that. Maybe, maybe get a good mixer, but I don't want to spend any more than that because I want to save everything else for promotion and marketing. You know, okay, I wanted yeah. to buy a bus. I wanted to be sort of self-sufficient and do yeah. everything on our own. And we kept on getting weird. It was just a weird situation where part of that decision was good and part of that decision was bad, right? So basically what I hadn't learned yet was that guys who are record, you know, record executives per se don't have a, an enormous amount of, ma of imagination. So <clears throat> when I would make a demo of a song that everybody universally thought was really good, if it sounded like a demo, they heard a demo. Right. So no one was there to translate that I was presenting it as a demo, but they were thinking that this is what I'm presenting as the album. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, here's the album. 
here's the song. They're hearing it as this is my submission for the album. It's clearly a demo. Right. But it's good enough that they think, I think this is the record. And no one is talking to each other. Uh, no one is saying, is this the album or are we going to recut all this? Right. No one said that to me once. They really? also never even, when it came to like talking about producers and stuff like that with $425,000 budget, I only knew a couple of people that I really liked and trusted. And because they weren't necessarily available in the time frame that I wanted, I basically said, okay, well, screw it. I'm going to go ahead and, and do this myself. And which is ultimately a bad decision, but partially I made that decision because literally no one, not management, not the record company, not my A&R guy, not anyone ever said, hey, by the way, I just want you to know you have enough money in your budget to get anyone. Anyone you want to use for this album, you can afford because yeah. that's how much money you have in your budget. No one ever told me that. I didn't know I could get Terry Date or Brendan O'Brien or, you know, all the guys that I loved who I didn't right. know. Oh, because man. in my mind, those guys were going to be way too expensive. So right. why even bring it up? And it never got brought up because they thought they assumed that I just wanted to save the money and I assumed I couldn't afford it. So it right. never got discussed. Damn. Um, yeah. By the way, my original game plan for the album was for me to co-produce it with a guy named Dave Schiffman. And Dave Schiffman to me is, is arguably the greatest a, a music engineer for hard rock that's ever existed. There's no one to me, his, his Rolodex or his, his resume of audio slave system of a down yep. uh, to the red hot chili peppers. Um, uh, uh, what's the bat country bands uh, seven, uh, Avenged sevenfold. Yeah. I mean, all, all of the bands that this guy has worked with <coughs> and I know him really well. They all have the best sounding records. Yeah. It sounded so good. So my goal was, look, I know, I know that Dave wasn't really necessarily a song guy, but I was like, look, my songs are solid. I just need to make them sound so good that they're ridiculous. Yep. So for my budget was going to be like, Dave, I'm going to pay you 1200 bucks a day to do this album. And it was really going to work out great, except that my ex-wife was sick and I was in New Jersey. And Dave had just adopted a child in Los Angeles. So he couldn't leave LA. I couldn't leave Jersey. Oh, and shit. therefore that was the A, the, the, the A plan just went out the window. And again, instead of just picking the next best person to do it, I was just like, well, screw it. I'll do it myself because I didn't yeah. know anyone else. And no one else was recommend. No one said to me, go and get this guy. He's amazing. Now I know who everyone is. Now I know <laughs> I probably would have gone to Joe Berezi and made an incredible record. Sure, but sure. It's just there was no one to tell me that back in the day. Yep, yep. Man, that's so crazy. It, it, I mean, the, that whole time period, was that the Napster time? Was that before that? Oh, a, little, a little after, but, yeah. but it's still, yeah, it's still Napster. That's when and, and everything's you know, the, just going crazy. The, yeah, but I think, you know, when you look at it, what I, what I was always, when I look back at it, what, what's always startling to me is that any business with a, you know, a finite annual budget, right? Looking at a project and saying, this is our, our big investment. We're investing a half million dollars in this project, at least. Yeah. So who, how do we, do we just let it, how, most people, you just don't let it do it on its own. Right. Like there's like a convert, like that. What I didn't understand was now that I look back, there was so much trust in my ability mm -hmm. that a lot of it went the wrong way because no one was even making suggestions. It wasn't even like, right. it wasn't even like there was a conflict. Like they were saying, do this. And I would say, no. There was nothing. There was no suggestion Weird. as to which way to take it. There wasn't like, you know, you should probably try this dude. Although eventually, once I'd already screwed up and made a mess of things to a certain extent, in the sense that we were trying to figure out what to do because they didn't, they, no one was jumping up and down over the songs that I had first sent in. Then they said, well, why don't you meet this guy, Bob Marlette? And I met Bob and we had this thing and 
we spent an enormous amount of money on four songs that ended up not even being important songs on the record yeah. because ultimately the songs that all everybody liked were all the songs I already had done for forty thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, the first single on the second album is Fallen Angels. It did very well. Yeah, it's a great song. And, and that was that song was written. I had that song in the can when I did the first album. And so I knew that that was going to be the first single from the next record, but there, again, the, the, the loss of translation, the loss of, of like <coughs> the communication and sort of the, the fear-based decisions that a lot of things that are associated with art end up. But one of the, you know, I'll say this is one of the things that I, I learned very quickly, even for my few years in the movie business was how organized and detail oriented the movie business is because it's obviously much Very, more money yep. and the, and how loose and sort of chaotic music can be some yep. places more or less, less than others. But for the most part, there's a lot of, you know, anxiety and fear calling the shots yep. in the music business. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've, I mean, I've done, I've worked with many productions, um, you know, low budget and stuff like that. I actually, have had, I don't know if you know, BJ McDonald, he directed the Foo Fighters movie and a bunch of other stuff. So I've, I've got a bunch of uh, production people here and uh, on the podcast. And yeah, it's so, I mean, pre-production is so much planning and so much drafting out with storyboarding and everything. And, you know, your day is completely scheduled. Everything, the whole, the whole process is completely scheduled. So, I mean, we're, yeah, the music industry at that time was just, I don't. Yeah, it's just crazy. It's just. It's just yeah. Not- I mean, and again, it, you know, it's it's the, it it's in it it really had to do with certain people. Certain more, you know, certain label people were more hands on. I sure. think Avery and Monty Lipman were probably more focused on pop and top forty in in terms of the fact that they knew that that was going to what was going to keep the lights on. And so there was, you know, the rock stuff got a little bit of this, you know, stepfather attention. Yeah. But the. Um, but when we were doing stuff, you know, they were concerned because it was a lot of money. Oh yeah. But at the end of the day, they had, you know, there really just wasn't a lot of guidance and I don't know, you know, and maybe that's just because I made it hard to make them feel like they could give me guidance. Sure. Could have been, but you know, I was, I was definitely open to it, but I may not have seen that way, you know, that, I mean, that, that time period was that. Were for you getting that label? Was that like them scouting you out? I mean, you kind of mentioned already you, that you kind of kind of had some connections there. Was that like uh, something where like uh, you know, like a showcase where they come out and see the bands and like back then they did a lot of scouting now, they, and stuff like that. They signed us strictly off of what we did in Boston. Oh, so okay, all right. We ended up on the air in Boston. We sold twenty thousand CDs by ourselves in Boston. They'd never even seen the band. All right. So the you, they you signed a full package already in play. All right. They gave us a phone call. I got a phone call saying, Hey, we're signing Universal for two albums. That's what that's what I got. Awesome. So there was no there was no shopping of this. You know, at that point there was no shopping. Okay. The funny thing is Universal had passed on the demos back in the day. Same songs. Oh, okay. But, oh, really? But it is what it is, you know. Yeah, I mean, I get it. You want they want to see there's going to be a quick return on their investment and all that. So yeah, I mean, get I, that. You know, it was already getting to the point where, <clears throat> you know, collecting data was faster, and now collecting data is instant instantaneous. But yeah. in those days, collecting data was getting faster, and they knew that the ba- the best way to make an investment is to have as much data that points towards success before you, you know, make a huge commitment. Yep. Yep. Jumping on to that second album, uh, Duality, I got to say that was my introduction to the band. And it's like one of my favorite albums of that time period. And, and for me, dude, for me, every little thing she does is magic was like, holy cow, dude, I've always wanted a heavy metal police song. I always wanted the police to be heavy metal because I loved what they did, but they just weren't heavy enough for me. I wanted right. heavy metal. And then you guys came out with that. I was like, holy fuck, dude. I want to hear synchronicity next. I want to hear this next. I was like, come on, give me more. So anyway, that was my introduction to you guys with every little thing she does is magic. And I freaking love that album. That album is killer, killer album. So congrats on those first two albums, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> and all the yeah. albums. I mean, I love all, I mean, you, your songwriting, I mean, we'll talk more about this, but your songwriting to me, I, I'm a musician as well. I'm a singer as well. I'm, I'm probably a, 
B, C, D tier version of you on a much lower, lower everything. Uh, and my style of writing, you know, uh, is very influenced by a lot of the stuff that you are working with and a lot of stuff that you're writing and stuff like that. Um, so it was very cool to see, uh, to hear your songs and stuff like that. And then to see you live and stuff like that, your voice is freaking amazing, dude. You were like one of the best male singers in rock, even today. I mean, you, I just, you and I just hung out what a month ago or whatever. And live, your voice is insane. Awesome. Live. Awesome. Awesome voice. Yeah. Uh, and you sound so much like Sting is crazy. <laughs> I was like, I, the, uh, the, the Sting thing for me was, a was a cross to bear for a while. But I think by the time 2002, 2003 rolled around, I knew how to tweak it so that it was really me. Yep. Um, the, but yeah, talking about the albums, you know, it's funny because every, uh, all of the albums have moments that I absolutely love, but as a complete work, I think the newest record I put out is sort of like a lot better than mm -hmm. all of the other records. Like, so, so, you know, there's, there are things on the new record that are designed to sort of be the cousins of existing raw songs, but for the most part, you know, I always had problems with like, oh, I hate the kick and the snare in this record. Oh, I hate this. I hate, oh, I hate that. Oh, this is just not full enough. Or these moments are dead or whatever it is. There's so much less of that on this. Like I listen to this album and I, and I still hear like sort of missed opportunities to make things, certain things cool, but a, a lot less than if I listen to those earlier records where um, I think the raw creativity of From One and Duality is uh maybe just a tiny bit more unique but there are more crappy songs that no one ever talks about on both of those records which is interesting because people always oh that's your best record that's your best record i'm like yeah but you're not even mentioning the four songs that sort of just lay there sure, you know what sure, i mean sure. whereas like on on Intercorrupted, there's really only, if I had to be forced to pick something, there's one song that I think isn't amazing all the way through, whereas everything else makes me completely satisfied. Yeah, it's, Intercorrupted is awesome. I mean, I mean, I, 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 your, your writing style is like the heavy, sometimes baritone guitar, but with the melodicness of your writing is just like right in that sweet spot. I was talking with, with Ben last night. I'm not Ben, uh, with Brian last night from uh, Red. And Red's got, you know, for me, Red also is that sort of sweet spot of heavy, but melodic and stuff like that. I mean, that is right in, I mean, I just love that style of, your style of writing uh, for these songs. It just sounds so cool. Heavy, but melodic with so much feeling and excellent range of, singing you know you I, I just i just love that that you know overall production you guys bring to it yeah it's cool you know like the red guys um it's interesting we're like sort of one band separated right because they're sure. they work they work with a guy that has worked with star set and yep. i worked on those albums as well yep um the red guys are cool you know it's interesting for me because the uh the universe of what I call butt rock, uh, radio rock, whatever you want to call it. Yep. You know, it, it, it's always been fairly diverse. You know, that's the interesting thing about it. Like pop is now, you know, last 15 years, pop has become incredibly diverse and eclectic, but sure. for a long time it was fairly narrow, but now rock is, you know, rock is still somewhat diverse. I mean, it's gotten to the point now where, there's sort of a sound that has created an entire lane where there's probably six or seven of the main bands that all sound the same. Yep. Um, and they're all doing essentially the same thing. And to a certain extent, it's, 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 it's various versions of bring me the horizon, but it's, but it's that lane. Sure, sure, sure. And then, you know, and then there's all the stuff that's sort of like <coughs> rock where it has a, 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 even the semblance of a bluesy, kind of like feel to it in any shape or form that lane still exists. And then, you know, and then you have the core artists and what's interesting about, you know, the butt rock universe versus obviously the pop universe is, is the pop universe sort of 
re, re uh, you know, it, it changes in the guard. The guard changes fairly frequently, although less lately, but, but still it changes, you know, four or five years. It's, it's, it, it, there's a lot of changing of the, of the yep. personnel. Whereas in rock, you know, we still, you know, Disturbed put out that first record in 2001 and they're still putting out records now and they are essentially perceived the same way. They're not sure. perceived, they're not, you know, they're not Judas Priest. Right. They're, they're Disturbed. So they have, still have that. It, it, it also leans towards the fact that the audience itself is aged. Yep. So, you know, the Butt Rock Universe age used to be, you know, 18 to 35. Now it's 22 to 55. Yep. Which is a uh, which is just true. That's actually what what the like. If you go to Octane, that's what they'll tell you the demographic yep. is. Yep. yep. Um, but there's a lot of interesting, you know, things that are happening in rock now where melodic stuff <coughs> is sort of normal. You know, you, you used to have, you know, now where where every verse is soft and right. every part has a lot. You know, yes. unfortunately, they start blending together. Right, because every every beginning of a song has a little loop and a little pad and a little squeaky yep. little singer that's singing soft and and then it gets louder and then there's this big massive rock radio chorus and everybody sings essentially the same kind yep. of chorus. But the um, but those bands that have sort of carved the line, have made a little bit of a shape for themselves. I think are interesting and i also think it's interesting you know like and and what i and this leads to right the, what we were going to talk about with what i do the bands that i work with because you know star set and nothing more bad wolves to a certain degree but there's but but really star set and nothing more those are two bands to me that have sort of they're in that world but they're not of that world yep you know and i find actually with star set because they've been around long enough now that there's more there they're, i'm starting to hear bands copying them oh yeah you know, and I'm also, you know, there, there's occasionally bands that copy nothing more, but that's, that's, that's a harder band to copy just because yep. there's more technical stuff going on there. And his voice um, is also insane too. <laughs> yeah. His voice is hard to cop and, and, and there's, you know, and the guitars and the drums and everything, it's, it's a little bit more mathy and complicated. So it's not yep. quite as easy to, to, yep. to steal the vibe. Um, but yeah, I think the, the, that, that blending of, <laughs> With me, again, you have to go way back to that Peter Gabriel police thing. Yep. And Joe Satriani, like you take those three guys, take all their musicality, shove it in a box and shake the box up. And that's how I want. Yep. That, I want the music to be that. But yep. then I want the guitars behind it to be Gojira meets Metallica. Like yep. I just want, that's what I want the backdrop to be. Yep. And I think that that's an interesting and cool and powerful and I think ultimately an international sort of sound, which is one of the, the bigger frustrations of not becoming a huge band isn't the fact that I don't have millions of dollars and can live that kind of life. It's much more the frustration of knowing that the, re the rest of the world was never really given a chance to dive in on what it is that I did, because I, right. honestly, feel, I honestly feel that that, that part of, the musicality of what I was doing was far more international than even, um, you know, I think we would have done better overseas. You know, yep. I mean, there, there are bands, there are bands like, you know, people don't know if you're American, you don't realize that Alter Bridge can sell out a 50,000 seat arena in Europe. Yeah, big time. Like yeah. They're a massive, massive band in Europe, bigger than here. Yep. And I think that that's, you know, we would have, I think we would have been far more, sort of international and sort of o overwhelming had we gone to Europe and really did that job. But yep. we, were, we were told so many times, you know, by Universal that, that rock didn't do well overseas because of Godsmack and Three Doors Down. They didn't think we would do well. And I was like, well, really? do we sell my Godsmack or Three Doors Down? Right. And yeah, that was it. Close. You know? Yeah. Very so different. Yeah, literally the guy in charge of international said, well, you know, we don't really do that well with rock bands overseas. So we're going to, you know, we're going to hold off on that for a while. Yeah, it's just that weird timing where I, th I think they were just kind of losing grip on what was really happening in, in the industry at the time. I don't know. I'm just guessing. I just think also, you know, at a certain point, it became a thing of well, we've got a million dollars in this band. How are we going to make this money back? We can't spend another half million just to get around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. Yeah. Totally. <laughs>
Hey, thanks for watching part one of our interview with Sahaj from Ra. Hope you enjoyed it. You can check out our other guests and all our other episodes on all your favorite podcast locations. You can also watch on YouTube by searching for Tales from the Pit podcast. Go to our website, talesfromthepit.net. I'm Jason, and I hope you join us on the next one. This episode was edited and produced by me, Jason Lavasser. Visit talesfromthepit.net for more episodes just like this. I'll give you three things that I've learned. And this is, again, you know, 20 years ago when I was out on tour, my warm up was 30 minutes and it was crazy and it took forever and it was very complicated. And it, it was all kinds of scales and all kinds of blowing bubbles and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I and what I, realized, what I realized ultimately, the two things that really affected the way I sang was how I hydrated, the, 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 the way that I hydrated, and uh, what kind of blood flow was I getting through my whole body? Mm -hmm. So I know you were there. You saw me. I don't know if you saw me, but I was doing a lot of push-ups and doing a lot yep. of stuff like that. Yep. Partially because I want to look hot for the girls, but also <laughs> mainly to get my blood flow. And the blood flow part of it is, a, is an amazing, amazing way to get your system in gear to sing. Yep. But the... Um, the hydrating thing, I'll tell, I'll tell a small sort of trade secret. 